<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Advertising Wars panel. Um, Can I go there? Basically, we're... <laughs> do you want to swap seats? I'm yeah, come, come on. Come on. <laughs> That's much better. Um, so, Advertising war Wars, as we all know, publishers need revenue to survive. Brands need online to grow their digital savvy audience, and they have to use that uh, using those of us who live and consume online media. However, ad blocking uh, blocks brand advertising and makes online publishers less attractive for ad spend. How do we solve the issue? So for the next 20 minutes, what we're really going to look at are the problems that the brands advertisers are facing today, but equally then the solutions, the innovation solutions that these guys are coming up with. So seated to um, my right, we'll start over here with Shannon. Uh, Shannon Reid, President, President Digital at MEC. Uh, seated beside her here in the middle is Harry Cargman, founder and CEO of Cargo. And to my immediate right, we have Mike McAvoy, President and COO of The Onion. So I thought that the first place we would start yeah. is just talking about that ad block ellipse. Um, we've obviously seen a lot of commentary on this in, in recent weeks in the media. And I thought a good place to start would be the, this IAB uh, executive quote that we've seen in the media in recent weeks, which is, the scraping of dimes may have cost us dollars in consumer loyalty. And trying to kind of get our heads around, is it almost too late to win back the trust of our audiences? Mm. Shannon, putting that out to you, do you, do you think it's <laughs> as bad as has been made out there that we, the scraping of dimes has just cost us millions in, in ad revenue? I don't think it's ever too late to win them back. I just think we have to be a bit more creative about how we do it, and we need to be a lot more transparent about the value that we're bringing to them and the value that that advertising ultimately brings back to the people who are creating the content. Because without advertising, who's paying for the content? Without somebody paying for the content, how are we going to have great content creators? And we, we end up squeezing the very thing that we want to get for free and the value proposition starts to die. And what have been some of the bad examples, Harry? Like, what makes your blood pressure boil when you go to websites? What are some of the examples in recent months and years that you've seen and just kind of... Well, I, I think there's four things that are really destructive in the industry right now. Um, number one is the amount of interstitial uh, inventory. We actually do a lot of interstitials because we're forced to based on viewability. Um, but when you don't frequency cap it, and it's the same ad over and over and over again, it's so monotonous. I think people are like, enough. Like, I, I can't see that. If you can actually vary the ads and actually have it sort of sequence um, different experiences between the different creatives that are there, that's where it becomes much more interesting. So that's the first thing that I think is a disaster. Second is many people are worried about um, you know, the, the transparency of where's their data going and how are people using it. Um, so to the degree that we can actually, as an industry, be really creative about communicating to people, this is why we're selecting this data. It's actually a good thing for you. And the reason that it's a good thing is that all of those crappy ads that you don't want to see that have nothing to do with you because you're not geriatric, and so therefore poise depends diapers are not <laughs> the, right, the right product for you. Get, getting, getting your hands around the data as a way to actually have it more tailored and specific um, is, I think, the second thing that we need to do, because we're, and we're not doing that well today. Um, and then the third is, most people say that ad blocking truly came out of the fact that you're serving a 30-second pre-roll on a minute worth of content. Who wants to actually see a 30-second pre-roll to actually access something that's only 60 seconds? So, you know, where I sit, which is mobile, figuring out how to create the right video formats that are six to eight seconds, that's, that's the next step in the... Okay. in the process. Yeah. And picking that up, Mike, yeah. like what are some of the instances through your work with The Onion and maybe other websites that, that you've looked at where it's just poor user audience experiences? Yeah, I mean, I think it all starts, uh, kind of goes back to Shen's point in the beginning, which is, you know, uh, publishers need to get paid in some way for the content they create in order to invest as much as they can into it. And I think the problem with a lot of advertising is that it's terrible. It uh, talks down to you know, the audience. It doesn't trade off any of the loyalty that a publisher creates for that audience. And in the end, it's obtrusive, but ultimately doesn't, it, it just doesn't work. And so I think the problem with user experience, you know, uh, you know, adding to the three uh, pieces that Harry said, 
is that the advertising quality in terms of creative mm -hmm. and length just isn't effective digitally okay. for most brands. So picking up that word creative, Shannon, you've talked before, <laughs> the next revolution in media is going to have to occur in the in world creative. of creative. What, what, do you, what do you mean? Lay it out yeah. for us here in yeah, terms of it solution has, driven. It has to change. So, I mean, these guys make a really good point. The creative that we're serving is terrible. Uh, and, and not all of it is terrible. I hate yep. to do that. Yep. There are some really good creative out there. And some of it is using the knowledge that we have about the consumer and making sure we are actually giving them something that they can and should care about. And sometimes we're entertaining and sometimes we're educational and those are all really good things. The problem is we don't have enough volume of creative to deliver on the number of impressions that we're putting in front of consumers, right? So you've got this overabundance of inventory. Creative costs are very, very expensive for advertisers. So creating multiple sequenced messages, creating things that can speak to consumers in a different way each time we see that consumer and being able to sequence that messaging, that gets really expensive fast. And so I think the next revelation, revolution that we need to have in this industry is an opportunity to blow up how we charge and how we develop creative. We need to get to a rapid fire prototyping system in the creative world. We need to get to a space where we are producing creative in an automated way so that it can get the message out in the right place, but not in a place that it's ugly and we don't want to participate with it because we still want a beautiful user experience at the end of the day. So what does that look like, Harry? Give us some maybe case studies, what, what you guys are thinking about in Cargo, of what that experience is. So we're, we're focused, uh, again, on great brand executions in mobile. And, and our, I'll give you a couple examples of things that we're thinking about that I think will be interesting. Um, so if you look at Snapchat as a, a, their sort of creative formats that you're seeing there, which is a, a six to eight second uh, vertical video um, that has slides associated with it, um, it, it allows you to do interactive, and actually you see how much time it's going to be there with six to eight seconds being the maximum. That as a format, I think, is a, is a really interesting format. Um, we're doing things like looking at where the creative sits on that page. So if you're on an editorial page and you have the photo at the top and the article at the bottom, imagine if you can sort of put a shine slightly on top of the actual photo, which is the editorial photo, and if the consumer taps it, it actually unveils on the other side of it uh, a piece of, of ad creative that is attuned to the content on the page itself. So thinking about new formats like that, where it's actually uh, user-generated or user-initiated, where they actually tap that photo of wondering what the hell's going on, and it actually reveals an interesting ad format. Things that sort of um, surprise the user. Um, we're thinking about a lot of formats that are not banner formats, what we call beyond the banner. How do you, how do you have a piece of, of uh, mini advertising that sort of sits on the page, mm -hmm. and maybe as you scroll, it falls into a, a banner placement that sits on the page itself, where you have this interactivity. Really trying to evolve how and where advertising gets integrated so it's less intrusive and invasive, more beautiful, and Ultimately, the consumer sort of is surprised by it. And that's, that's something that we've been very focused on is, is changing up the consumer experience so it's not the same banner with banner blindness over and over served 50 times okay. to the same consumer within a span of you know, five minutes. Okay. Given that The Onion always aims to surprise yeah. <laughs> in every way possible, what is the approach of Onion Labs in terms yeah. of this? I've, I've seen you talk before in your mantra being, training, not tricking your audience. What do you yeah. mean by that when it comes to, to, to advertising? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we've, the Onion's worked for 27 years to build uh, a very loyal following and is, you know, really have probably offended everyone in this room at least once. <laughs> Um, and, you know, part of that is just, you know, is what satire is all about and putting a spotlight on society. And so for advertising, we need to be really clear to our audience what's an ad and what isn't. And we also need to make sure with Onion Labs that the advertising content we create is as good as the publishing content we create. And we found the most success, you know, going back into the economics of, you know, content creation, if you can get ideas that you're really excited about and a brand is also excited about, you can create some really successful campaigns. And one of my favorites is uh, something we had done with Jack Lynx a year ago and launched the site ClickHole. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, um, you probably shouldn't be at a web conference. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. pretty and fantastic. At the same time. So, but that's a great example of a brand <laughs> underwriting a content initiative and being able yeah. to integrate um, smartly into it. That's actually, I think, going to be 
the biggest opportunity. So we can take all the static banner unit inventory that we have out there and get better at it, and we need to get better at it, but the opportunity to create custom content, custom executions, custom placements on behalf of our clients, bringing true content and, and creative and editorial together in interesting ways. We do it for Netflix all the time uh, with folks like the New York Times, with folks like Vanity Fair, and it creates an amazing user experience. It brings more reality to what the consumer is ultimately experiencing, and it gives more value actually to the advertiser as well because it associates them with something that's a bit bigger than just by now. And when you talk about creating beautiful, rich content, what about the role of video and actually starting to rethink how we do that? Like, I work for a company that, that works in social media right. content, and what we're starting to see is that brands, advertisers, rather than hire expensive studios and actors, are going, actually, why don't we take real content that people have uploaded on their smartphones, has been verified, authenticated, take real content to speak to real people in new, authentic, meaningful ways? Is that something as well, when you talk about creative, that we have to rethink how we do video as well? Your company is one of the ones that we're working to partner with right now, because I do think it's it's a tremendous opportunity for us to say, you know, not all content is created equal, nor should it be, but there's value in a lot of it. And finding the, the beauty of what I can create on my smartphone in a matter of moments should not be completely dismissed. I mean, the, the volume that's getting created out there, if I can then reward the, ex, the, the person who's actually developed that content on their smartphone or taking a picture, I took a picture of all of you actually as I was walking in that I posted on Instagram. You're welcome. Um, well, that's a good idea, I'm gonna do that now. <laughs> you could like that later. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it, it, you know, those types of images are as, hope not as good as what this great photographer is probably creating, but still really great content that can be and should be shared and valued um, and can be used in the advertising space provided we actually give the credit back to and pay mm -hmm. the person who's creating it. It creates a whole new ecosystem of creators and that's really exciting for brands to play with. It's scary. Yeah. Um, because you're turning over the, the brand equity of the brand that you've worked on so hard to somebody else and trying to say, are you going to live up to the expectation of, of what I need? But if you're, if you're the one that's controlling it and, and determining what you use, then you've got the ability to do it, and it's going to work well, quite well. So, okay, better content served up in different ways. We've nailed that one. What about then educating our audiences? Yeah. Harry, you've made the point that we have to kind of culturally teach people that this is effectively stealing when we turn on an ad blocker. Give us your thesis on this, because it's an interesting one. <laughs> well, so, so my thesis very simply is, there is work that needs to be done first by the industry to make the pages lighter, to load faster. Um, clearly and unequivocally, when you actually look at the press, what you see is that there has to be work done by the publishers so that there isn't such a huge disparity between sites that actually have advertising running on it and sites that don't. Um, there's a huge, um, you know, there's a sea change in, in terms of sort of the, the load times associated with both of those things. But the reality is that publishers' only revenue source, if you're not paying a subscription, is advertising. And advertising is the lifeblood to enable and to keep employed all of those writers, producers, editors um, at these, these great places that you like to visit. And so if you're consuming their content without paying for it, why is that any different than consuming, for example, um, a piece of music um, for free um, that, that basically people paid a lot of time to produce, or consuming a movie and downloading it and ripping it um, and, and, you, and basically viewing that movie for free? You know, the value of content is that it teaches you, you learn from it, you know, certainly when you go to school, if you go to a university, you pay a lot of money, potentially, for that education. And we continue as employed citizens to, to basically read up and keep ourselves educated. And so the only way for that to be paid for is, is obviously the advertising today. And so I really liken ad blocking to ripping music or, or basically downloading free movies um, from the internet, and there's really no difference. That being said, I think that there needs to be some work done because if you're actually um, having an inferior experience due to the advertising, that does need to be fixed. So, Mike, if you were to accept the thesis that yeah. ad blockers is the equivalent of, of stealing, yeah. should we block the ad blockers? And we've started to see some initiatives like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, um, I think it's an interesting thesis, and I don't... Uh, 
you know, fully disagree with it. I think it all comes back to kind of the first point, which is there needs to be a value proposition from, you know, what a user wants to consume for content, what they're willing to pay for, whether pay is subscription or it's their tolerance, acceptance, appreciation of advertising. There has to be a correlation there because all content isn't created equal. And then I think from there, you know, you really are balancing user experience. So if you turn off ad blockers, in a way, you're removing some of the people from, you know, uh, you're hurting their user experience. So we tend to have the view that a lot of it's native advertising for us, and so ad blocking doesn't play as big a part as it does for other publishers because in the end, we're creating something for our audience that happens to be advertising, and that isn't you know, blockable today. And ultimately, it's entertaining. Do you think it's too aggressive to block the ad blockers, Shannon? Do you think there should be some kind of whitelisting mechanism? I think there should be some kind of whitelisting mechanism. I think that's an opportunity for the industry. I also think it's an opportunity for the industry, and there's, there's some talk happening about this already, for, for there to be some type of third-party auditing system that says, this is what good advertising looks like, mm -hmm. and have the ad blockers whitelist those types of ads um, in advance, working with the creative agencies, working with the media agencies to say, this is, this is what we're going to let through because our consumers are going to be okay with it. Um, but I do think we need to reevaluate what we're putting in front of consumers. I, I do not want my children growing up in a world where the great writers, um, even the funny writers yeah. that we have, are being limited in what they're capable of doing, or God forbid our news writers aren't able to actually check on the efficacy of their own stories before they get published, and we get more and more bad news, right? We need the news to be correct as often as we can get it correct. And the more we squeeze on the publisher and content side, the more we're gonna have, the less we're gonna have of really good comedic writing, and the less we're gonna have of news that we can actually feel is valid and appropriate. But it gives us a lot more, you know, to write about at The Onion, which well, I appreciate. Yeah, well, there's so, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we still wanna make sure your writers get paid. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think that's the, and that's, that's the point. Yeah, the ripping music parallel I do get, because at the end, you have to find a way to pay for premium content because if you don't, it, it ends up being a race to the bottom and ultimately, right. you know, everyone loses. It does make advertisers like ours take, and, and agencies like ours take a step back and say, okay, what do we need to be doing more in native, in the, in the native space? Because it is a place that we can play in that we provide better value to our, our customers and better value to their, to their audience, whether it's serious content or funny content, doesn't matter. So my final question to each of you as we wrap up, if 2015 was the year that we really started to get to grips with ad blocking and owning up to the need to a better quality content, yeah. quality experiences for users, audiences, and clients alike, what is going to be the theme of 2016? What actually excites you? We kind of started on a little bit of a doom and gloom scenario at the beginning in terms of the problems and challenges, but what excites you going into 2016? What do you think we'll be talking about this time next year? Well, I hope we're not talking about something as negative as ad blocking, and I hope instead we're talking about something that's maybe a bit more exciting, like new ways of paying for advertising um, that are valuing people's time, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But I think, the, I think there's opportunities to, to really reevaluate how we go to market as advertisers. Harry? I'm hoping that the pages in 2016 load significantly faster with advertising, so there is no reason <laughs> to have an ad blocker implemented. Mm -hmm. I hope the creative gets significantly better and we're trying to lead the way in terms of making that happen. Um, I think there should be more choice, right? Consumers should actually participate in the advertising cycle and be able to give adequate feedback. I like seeing more about the, these brands, these brands I have an affinity with. This doesn't talk to me and I'm never gonna buy a product no matter how much you advertise to me. So being able to communicate back to the advertising tech layers and to the actual marketers about what you're interested in seeing, I think that will break through. I mean, advertising isn't inherently bad. People love watching advertising during the Super Bowl. Absolutely. People actually tune into the Super Bowl to see advertising. Mm -hmm. um, but that's because a lot of time and effort and care is spent to putting messages out there that are better tailored, more humorous, um, better produced. And so if we can bring some of that energy to, to digital, I think that's when things become really interesting. Okay. Yeah. And, Mike? and I think, yeah, to that end, I think uh, 2016 needs to be, your, need to be a year of innovation on the creative side, which includes obviously the product and the you know, ad executions themselves. But ultimately, creating great advertising is the way to you know, win over the user experience um, debate. 
Okay, great, we'll leave it at that. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a large round of applause to Mike McAvoy, President and COO with The Onion, Shannon Reid, President Digital at MEC, and Mike McAvoy, President and COO of The Onion. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll wait for the next panel. Thank you.